Welcome to Composition 101, Remembering Music Theory, a course offered by musictherapyworks.com through our Composition and Creativity general course. Thank you so much for signing up for this, for this course module, and I hope that it will give you an opportunity to get back into some basic music theory thought as you are writing music to use in your clinic. Today, in our, for our learner objectives, we are going to be completing demonstration elements that will be based on the concepts of composition and creativity covered by each course module. And specifically, during this presentation, you will compose three musical pieces based on the techniques that are presented. And this is covered under the CBMT board certification domains under the section two dot a dot five and there's several different different elements that are addressed during in that domain subheading that we're going to be looking at today specifically on writing songs and comp composing our music today you'll need several different kinds of materials and i've gathered mine here together you're going to need a computer with internet access that's because i've got a, quite a few um, links for you to look at to help you just increase your your remembering of what went on in our theory class. You'll need a printer and paper. This the printer is specifically so that way you can complete your projects. It's not as essential that you have a printer for this particular course module as it is for some of the others, but some extra paper around will be helpful as you get into the composition aspect. Need a pen or a pencil. Got my pencil right here. And optional tools, you might want staff paper. It depends on how you compose. I honestly compose using index cards instead of staff paper, so I don't need any staff paper for this particular part. But eventually, I'm going to have an accompanying instrument of my choice and music soft composition software. And then the last thing that you might want are some dice, just a couple of dice hanging around. And these are materials that we're going to use on and off during this particular module. So why do we need to remember our theory? I mean, honestly, theory is, is our foundation. Music theory is our foundation. It's our structure. It's, it's how we do what we do. You know, there are reasons that chord progressions are popular and well used. And part of that's no novelty, part of that's familiarity. And, and we have studied those psychological underpinnings. And the second thing is that it's easy to get into a rut when we use music as our tool. And so it's important for us to get back to theory basics as we can, because that helps us increase, reinvigorate our music and get our clients engaged and active in the musical aspect. We took all those theory courses for a reason. You know, I, I took four semesters four semesters or five semesters, I don't even remember now, but lots and lots of music theory and lots of, of high credit hour courses. And so, you know, music theory wasn't just a one little piddling little hour course. It was a big deal. And we took all those theory courses for a reason. And theory is something to be purposefully practiced. In the, a while ago, I did an intern, an informal intern survey, and I asked them all what advice they would give to a music therapy student getting ready to go into their internship. And almost every single one of them said, don't sell your theory book back. And when I started to think about that, I realized, you know, theory is something we use every day. Music theory is something that that's part of what we do, whether it be reading a melody line and trying to come up with an accompaniment or listening to a client express themselves vocally and having to come up with, with an accompaniment pattern to, to support that vocalization. Maybe we are learning a new song. Maybe we need to transpose our song from the key that it's written in to a key that is more appropriate for our clients. And so this is something that we use all the time. We took all those theory courses, but it's something that we need to be purposeful in our practice, because if we're not purposeful with our practice, we kind of lose those skills. We can also use theory to increase our musical sophistication and our skill. You know, nothing is worse than listening to somebody struggle through a rendition of, of Jingle Bells and they 
don't remember the secondary dominant that, that occurs in that song. And you can listen to it and think, huh, something's missing, something's wrong. You may not necessarily know what that is. But as soon as you, you figure out the theory to the song and you see that there's a good place for a secondary dominant, your music sounds more sophisticated. And so using theory can help you save a song from being just kind of blah to being something that is is very engaging for your client. It's easy to get into a rut when we use music because that's our tool every day. And if you've ever found yourself using the same chord progressions all the time or using the same tonal centers, everything you do is in the key of D because it's your home key and you feel comfortable there, or the same old songs happening all the time, then it's time to, to shake, out, shake out of your rut and to get some other material. And you can use theory to shake things up. All of a sudden, you change the modes of a song and it's a brand new song. All of a sudden it feels different, it sounds different, there's lots of other things happening. Your clients pay a little bit more attention to it because instead of presenting the song in a major key, you're presenting it in a minor key and they're noticing that it has changed. And that helps us to, to use theory to shake things up. So our first experience here is the dice game. And the dice game is one that's been around for a long time. It's rumored to be a way that Mozart composed occasionally, uh, especially when, when involved in kind of a creative rut. And basically what it does is it takes away the need for the, the composer to have a logical thought process because you can just f leave it up to chance. Composition is not dictated by anything other than selection, random selection of things, and then it's up to the composer themselves to, to keep it exactly as it is, or to, to provide a um, framework and a structure for it. So for this, you need um, a couple of, you need either dice or small pieces of paper. Today, I'm going to use small pieces of paper that I have prepared because I um, don't have my dice with me right now. But if you, if you are doing dice, then what you're going to do is you are going to use a piece of paper and you're going to write down a key, a legend. So on your piece of paper, you might say a one equals the letter C, a two equals the letter D, a three equals E flat, four equals F, five equals G, and six equals A. Let's see, it would need to be A flat, one minute, in the key of C minor. And you're going to write that down and you're going to hold on to that because it's important that you have your legend. Now, if you're going to use more than one dice, or if you would like to do so, you can also assign number values to notes. And I showed you my pink cards, they had notes. These are my green cards, and my green cards have letter values. And my pink notes have the, the note values. And so, I know that if I if I pull this particular card, that it's going to be a dotted eighth note. And this particular card, it's going to be a dotted quarter note. You could do that. You can use dice to put in rests. You can use dice to put in uh, decrescendos and crescendos. It depends on how, how complex you want to get. We're going to stay pretty simple with this particular, this particular uh, activity. So we're going to play the game. And in order to play the game, I'm going to put my green cards, my note value cards, into a small box. It's a Star Wars box, just in case you care. And I'm going to do that because I've got it nearby. And, and I'm going to put these in and I'm going to shuffle them up so that way you can't see any of the notes. I'm going to put those in. And I am going to simply start to pull a piece of paper. And so my first one is an E. So I'm going to take my index card here because I compose on index cards and I'm going to write E. I'm going to put that back into the box and shuffle it around again. And I'm going to continue to pull pieces of paper and write down the result. The next one is an A until my song is complete. Now, Sometimes you need to put some structure in front of you before you get going. There's a C. 
And so you say, okay, we're going to do a 16 measure song. Oh, and by the way, at the end of this module, I'm going to tell you how you can take the three songs that you are writing as part of this course uh, composition and how you can change that into 15 CMTE credits. So pay attention at the end of the, this because with a little bit of extra work, you can turn the songs that you use here today into therapeutic music experiences and get more CMTEs for them. G is the next one. So I want a 15 measure song. I'm going to just make a um, random decision that my song is in 6-8. There is no wrong. So you can do anything you want to. Um, there's another A. And then I'm going to have an, another E. And so all I'm doing here is I'm just putting them back in randomly. There's an F, mixing up in between each one. Another F, and I'm pulling cards. Another A, and a B. I just used the C diatonic scale at this point. I haven't done anything else with it. G, E, B, D, and so on and so forth. And that, that continues for a while. And then, as I am getting things ready and put together, I'm going to start doing the same thing with my other cards. So I'm going to start remembering that it's a 6-8. I'm going to put in the um, dotted eight or the dotted quarter note and put in the um, 16th note, the eighth note, and the dotted eighth note. And so now I've only got four options, but they're the four options that make the most sense with the meter that I've chosen. And I'm going to, I guess I could also put in the quarter note. And then I am going to start randomly pulling those. So my first note is going to be an eighth note. So that's an E as an eighth note. And then after that, the next note will be another eighth note. And I'm going to continue with that until every note has a, has a um, rhythmic value as well. Now with this, I, I admit that I do um, manipulate that a little bit just because it makes sense to have things that are that are eighth notes, dotted eighth notes, sixteenth and dotted quarter notes, as well as quarter notes in there, as opposed to having my full my full um, complement of note values, possible note values, because it doesn't make sense in a six eight. But at the end of that, I will have a melody and I'll have a rhythm. So now it's your turn. You're going to pause this right here, right now, to start the first song, to start composing your first song. You're going to make a melody of 16 measures minimum. You can choose your pitch center, your meter, any other musical choices, but don't try to do the accompaniment yet, because that'll be the next step that we do here. So, 30 seconds worth of ukulele music, hold on just a sec. <laughs> So now you've completed your melody. You've got a 16 measure melody and I picked that number very specifically because that's the number minimum that um, CMTE submitted songs have to be, 16 measures. You've got your melody line, you've figured out your key, you've figured out your rhythm, you've got an opportunity now to take this melody line and to prepare your accompaniment. I don't know about you, but I get very stuck in the same old rhythm, the same old patterns, accompaniment patterns, you know, one, four, five, or one, four, 
five, one, five of seven, five, a one, you know, and, and those types of things are okay, but there are so many other chords that you can use. You can use a minor two, you can use a minor six and, and helping to incorporate those chords into a melody gives it just a little bit more sophistication. And so here are two links that I found to be very helpful. Remembering chord progressions, and specifically they list all of the chord uh, chord possibilities for each scale step. So if you've got a melody, like my melody uh, at this point right now seems to be primarily in either A minor or C. I haven't played it all the way through yet, so I don't know for sure what it's gonna feel like to me. But anything, it'll list anything in that key that can be done if it's on the fifth scale degree, like say we're in A minor. My first, note, my first note is an E, so that could be a fifth scale degree in the key of E minor, and it'll tell me all of the different chords that would fit underneath that particular scale degree, and that would support that scale degree. Both of these provide just some, some links and some information for you to use as you are preparing your accompaniment, because that's what we're going to do next. I included the other one, the, the um, g -er one, because I love the title, Five Pleasantly Ambiguous Chord Progressions for a Song Verse. Just interesting information, I think. So now that you have resources to remind you of what chords can go with what scale degree, it's time to sit down and it's time to turn your melody, the one that you wrote down, the one that you composed, into a song by adding an accompaniment. And so you're going to take your 16 measures and you're going to complete the accompaniment aspect of your song. Make sure that you write it down. Play through several different chord progressions. You know, you might start off with, with just a basic one, four, five, and then you might find some places where you could put in that secondary dominant, that five of five chord. You might find places where you can, you can substitute a six chord or a two chord. And to give your melody just a little bit more um, novelty, a little bit more interest and and play through this several times and choose what feels right for you and one of the things that you you need to realize is that there is no wrong ever when you're composing that's the nice thing we learn all of our theory rules and we follow all of our theory rules you know 18th century theory patterns and in 19th century and and all those types of things but basically what it comes down to is you can play whatever you want whenever you want you know no no feeling all that concerned if you're doing parallel fourths or fifths if that's what you want then that's what you use and so there is no wrong now is the time you graduated from theory class so you no longer have to do all of those assignments like you you had to do before now's the time for you to explore and find out what works well for you so pause this slide and uh Write out your accompaniment. Come up with, with what you want this song to sound like. And while we're doing that, I'm going to play you a little bit more ukulele music. I apologize that it's all in the key of C, but I lost my chord chart. So here you go. today is going to be inspired by visuals. For this, you're going to need the same types of materials that you had before, staff paper, or music composition software, if you have it, any other ways to notate music the way you notate the best. Like I said, I'm all about the index cards, um, a pen and pencil, and then just a willing attitude. And one of the things that I'm going to want you to do for this is to start with an image. I go through magazine pictures and pull out advertisement pictures that cause me to to have a double take and I put them into my book so whenever I'm feeling like I need some inspiration I pull out one of those images there are some on the next page if you don't have any handy images right now or if you don't aren't quite as image driven as I am 
what you're going to do is you're going to write a story about the image. You're going to let your mind wander because I want you to, to really get into what it looks like and how it feels to you, the atmospheres, what it, the emotions that it brings up in you and how to get this working for you. And then for, for the melody of your song, you're going to take your story and you're going to refine that into a specific song. And you're either going to write an original melody that goes with the song, you're going to use the dice method, or you can piggyback your story onto another song to make it sounds for that song. We're going to now pause to complete the second sound and song, and I've got three pictures here for you if you would like to use them. You don't have to, but here are, are the pictures. There's a picture of a flat road and a fluffy white clouded sky, a picture of a half-eaten meal from In-N-Out Burger, which is my favorite place, fast food place in the world, a balloon over the hills of Albuquerque, and a cat exhausted on top of some clean laundry. So again, Take some time to complete your second song. You're going to write a story based on this image, and then you are going to write the melody line and the accompaniment line for this song. I'm going to improvise one. <laughs> very sophisticated, but not wrong either. So it's time to do our, our third song. And to do this, we're going to use some common chord progressions. And none of these should be very strange to you. They should be familiar to you. I switched from the ukulele to the guitar because I know more of the chord progressions on the guitar than I do on the ukulele at this point right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to use these chord progressions, either this one or one of the ones on the links on the next page to provide us with an improvisatory framework and structure that we can then use to create a melody and create a full song. So like I said, these chord progressions should not be unusual to you. The first one is 50s rock, um, a 50s rock progression. I'm going to do it in the key of G and um, it starts off with a one, six, four, five, seven. And it just continues. One, six, four, five, seven. One, six, four, five, seven. And then finish it off with a one, five, seven, and a one. If you want to get really fancy, you can throw in a really quick four there. You can also do the same one with a two. So instead of, um, let me see if I can remember. Instead of the four chord, so the major four chord, you would use a minor two. So one, six, two, five, seven. off the same way. One, five, seven, one. Just to give you, just to give you a little bit of a reminder of that particular chord progression and substituting that two for that four chord, for that major four chord, just gives it a little bit of an extra sophistication that doesn't happen if you just use the, the progression as is. Second one is 12 bar blues. And I've got to tell you, this is my home progression. This is the one I use almost always when I'm doing improvisation. And really what I need to do is I need to put up prompts around my, my session area. So that way I'll remember that there are other things that you can do. Uh, this one I'm going to play in the key of E. 12 bar blues, each one of these, these Roman numerals stands for one measure of the 12 bar blues. 
And then the last two there on uh, the last four, the first is a repetition, and then the last one is how to close the song. So in the key of E, one, one, one seven, four, four, one, one, five seven, four seven, one, one, five seven, one. So there's a 12 bar blues, very, 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 very familiar chord progression to us. Secondary dominance, uh, basic chord progressions, you, you can start off with a one, here's the key in the D, a key of D, yeah. One, use that as long as you want to, and then four. One, and then five, seven, five. That five of five, when you're in the key of D, when you hit up that that E major chord, that five of five, it just brightens things up a little bit, and it demands attention again. It makes things a little bit more novel, and so it's great to to add those in when you possibly can. So here are some chord progression resources and websites for you. Wikipedia has a great list of chord progressions. Um, singer songwriter chord progressions are available and then hooktheory.com is a uh, program that I, I enjoy using because it's very visual. It might be too much to handle for some folks who aren't visual like I am. That's okay. Use the progressions that use the resources that work best for you. So we're going to pause to complete the third song. You're going to choose a chord progression and you're going to develop a melody that goes along with that chord progression. If you want to add lyrics, you certainly can. That's something that um, I don't necessarily require for this course, but it might be something that you want to develop as you're developing the whole song. And again, there is no wrong and take your time. And now you get 30 seconds worth of improvisation by me. I think I'm going to use the first chord progression there. The um, that minor two chord because it gives me something to improvise to that's not my usual now when I'm composing I use these chord progressions purposefully but when I'm improvising things don't always Again, there is no wrong to this. Feel free to take your time. So we've come to the end. You should have three new songs now that you have composed. And let me tell you how to change your three songs into additional CMTEs. According to the Certification Board for Music Therapist Recertification Manual published in 2015, you can get up to five credits per composition and you can submit up to 20 credits per cycle. So four songs per, per five year cycle. But there are some things that you have to do in order to change your songs into, into CMTEs. It has to be an original music composition. You have to write this music yourself. You need to have a musical score printed out at least 16 measures in length and correctly notated by hand or by computer software. Some sort of, of um, fixed representation of that song. In addition, you also need to have an audio recording of the composition on audio tape or CD. I love how it says audio tape or CD. I mean, most of the time now, people don't use audio tape or CD. We just upload to the cloud. But you need to have an audio recording that is available for your auditors to pay attention to. You also need to think about your composition's therapeutic use. So my song about In-N-Out Burger, 
probably um, not really something I could submit because it was more just kind of a discussion. I don't have a comp I don't have a therapeutic use at this point. But if I really think and maybe shift some of the words a little bit, I could come up with one. This composition's therapeutic use needs to include the client populations for which you think this is appropriate. And if it's appropriate for a general population, then you can write general population. But you need to identify why you would use this particular song with a particular client type. You also need to address the therapeutic domains that are present in the course and, or in the song. And so if you are doing a song on favorite foods, that's an academic cognitive type domain. It's also social and communicative. If you are going to add a directive where they, they choose pictures of their song, then you've also got some motor domain. You're going to use as much of your goal brainstorming as you possibly can. And if you're interested in more information of that, about that, then I would suggest that you check out the therapeutic music development course module offered under composition and creativity through this course here, because we'll talk about that a lot more in that particular course module. You also need to have at least one specific therapeutic objective within the, within the stated domains. So for example, the In-N-Out Burger, if it is a, if I'm going to use it as an academic cognitive therapeutic music experience, then I'm going to need to write a very specific therapeutic objective within that domain of academic cognitive, such as client will choose three items that are commonly found at fast food restaurant from a field of 17 mixed objects, including edibles and non-edibles. And then that's a very specific therapeutic objective. And if you've got those three things going, for you, then you can use any of these songs and get an additional five credits per composition. So use it, use it, use it. You also need to have a procedure for implementing the composition to meet the objective. And like I said, if you want more information on how I do that and how I make it easy on myself to do that, please take our, our therapeutic music experience development course. So what you're going to do now is you're going to send me your demonstration elements, which is your songs. And you're going to send me your songs either through video link or with scans of the original songs to contact us at musictherapyworks.com. I would love to see you can you can send me pictures of your sheet music. You can send me you can send me links to your your videos, your audio videos. Either way works for me. Remember for CAB or CBMT credit, you need to do both of those things. So if you want to send me both, I would be happy to look at it, but you only have to send one or the other to me. Please send those links or those scans of your original songs to that email address, contact us at musictherapyworks.com. Once I receive them, I will send you an email acknowledging that receipt and will also send you the link to the course evaluation. One last thing that you need to know is that by sending me your original intellectual property, you need to know that I will never, ever, ever use it without your permission. I will not even use it with clients unless I ask you for that permission. That's an ethical responsibility and something I take very seriously. So please, please finish up your songs, send them to me, get the course evaluation, when you've finished all of the courses that you picked from this, this umbrella course, when you've finished all of your modules, I will send you the overarching evaluation link and your certificate. So thank you so much for choosing musictherapyworks.com for your CMTE needs. And I hope that, that you had fun composing some new songs. Thanks.